So I want to welcome everybody back from the lunch discussions. Uh, judging from the one that I was in, it was uh, interesting and, and lively and covered both some of the topics we discussed this morning as well as previewed some of the afternoon papers. Uh, so for the session three this afternoon, um, we'll be looking at fiscal policy as well as some international aspects of the crisis. Uh, the first paper is Fiscal Effects of COVID-19. Um, and it looks like Alan Auerbach is doing the presentation. So over to you. Thank you very much, Jan. Uh, actually, uh, Luis and I will be sharing, I'll, I'll sharing the presentation, I'll be starting. Uh, so uh, this is uh, uh, trying to look at the fiscal impacts of COVID-19. And uh, we're doing it in two pieces, uh, hence the uh, joint presentation. I'm gonna be talking about uh, the uh, impact that we estimate that COVID-19 uh, has had uh, on the federal budget outlook uh, over the next 10 and 30 years, sort of uh, separate pieces. Uh, and then I'm going to turn it over to Louise to discuss what the short and medium term impact on the fiscal conditions on state and local governments uh, is, in the, both in the aggregate and across states. Um, so let me, uh, in talking about the federal outlook, let me talk about our basic approach. Uh, we consider three separate baselines for fiscal policy. Um, we look at a pre-COVID uh, baseline based on current law, uh, a post-COVID baseline based on current law, and then a post-COVID uh, policy uh, baseline based on what we call current policy. Um, so the reason for these three baselines is that we're, we want to answer different questions. It, comparing the, the first and the second gives us an impact of the COVID shock itself. And that's not just the direct impact of the decline in economic activity, but also the policy responses. So the all in fiscal effect uh, of the shock, uh, taking into account government responses. Uh, and for this, it's, we're fortunate to have uh, estimates by CBO that were produced uh, in January, just before the shock uh, and in September, uh, very recently, uh, which more or less encompasses the shock so far, as well as projections for what will happen in the future. Um, we, uh, that, that uh, data from CBO or the projections from CBO uh, also go through 2050. Uh, we uh, start with that, but then we make uh, adjustment, a series of small adjustments uh, to what CBO has produced. The third baseline, uh, that is the policy baseline, is intended as a more realistic measure of what we actually are. By convention, uh, when CBO does projections, uh, they do it based on current law, except in cases where current law doesn't give you enough information. Uh, but very often, current law includes a lot of uh, uh, expiring provisions and other things that typically uh, are extended. And we, we, uh, we, we, it's very difficult to know exactly where to draw the line but we uh, in, in include a variety of extensions in what we think current policy trajectory actually is. So let me turn quickly to the key results for the, the federal uh, section of the paper. First, uh, the, the COVID shock in the short run is enormous. Uh, Non-interest spending is up 11% of GDP uh, in fiscal year 2020. A little bit of that is <clears throat> due to the decline in GB, GDP, but most of it's due to the, the increase in spending. Revenues are down a half a percent of GDP, and of course they're down more because GDP is down. Um, the primary deficit, uh, taking account of where it was projected to be before, is now projected to be uh, over 14% of GDP in the fiscal year, uh, current fiscal year, which ends uh, at the end, very soon at the end of September. Um, by according to the projections, the impact on primary deficits uh, is expected to dissipate rather quickly, certainly compared to, uh, say, the last recession. Um, by fiscal year, year 2022, so two years, basically two years from now, uh, the primary deficit is projected to be up only 2%, rather than over 11% of, of GDP. But even so, even with this fairly concentrated uh, recessionary impact on primary deficits. 
um, the, the magnitude of the short run uh, increase is so large that it still gives us a, a very high debt to GDP ratio. Uh, so that by in two years, we would be at a debt to GDP ratio of 106% um, and versus 184%, which was projected in January. Uh, that 106% is where we were in 1946 at the end of World War II. But of course, the future looks very different now than it did then. Um, projected interest rates um, are, were low in January, and at least in the next several years are projected to be substantially lower, uh, the, the relevant interest rates on the national debt. Um, and uh, there's a, a comparison of the current law uh, and the pre-COVID baseline uh, uh, from CBO. And you can see uh, that they're projecting interest rates that'll be uh, substantially lower uh, through, uh, through the early 2030s, and then actually a little bit higher thereafter because of, uh, because of the high debt level uh, leading by their estimate to, and, uh, to crowding out. Um, and as a result of these lower interest rates, there's a surprisingly small impact uh, if you go out to 2050 under current law uh, on the terminal debt to GDP ratio. By our estimate, 190%, that's slightly different from what CBO is projecting, versus 180%, uh, for the, which is what the projection was in January. And uh, that, you know, given the size of the short-term shock and the much higher debt to GDP ratio in the short run, uh, that is uh, uh, perhaps surprising with, without thinking about the interest rates. But of course, given this level of debt relative to GDP, the interest rates are pretty important. Um, on the other hand, under current policy, and I should say that our estimate, our, our, what we add to the budget under current policy is pretty conservative. Um, and I'll, I'll come back to that at the end. Uh, the de debt accumulation is higher. So here you can see uh, the projection of these three uh, baselines starting in 2020. And what you see is that the, um, uh, in the short term, uh, you just have this big jump in the debt to GDP ratio, but then this dashed line con converges toward the original projection in January because of lower interest rates. On the other hand, under current policy, it takes off and it gets up to um, it gets up to 222 percent by the end of the period. Well, and finally, um, you know, in terms of what will these projections mean? Uh, they may be so pessimistic in some respects. For example, since CBO came out with its economic forecast this summer, the 2020 recovery looks better uh, than it did then. Uh, but there's, there's a lot on the other side. Uh, interest rates uh, might pick up faster. Um, there might be much slower growth even after the recession, as was true in the, during the global financial crisis. That is, CBO may be underestimating the, uh, the long-run productivity shock of the recession. And finally, our policy changes, the ones we add to the estimates, are, as I said, quite conservative. Uh, and there are, one can imagine many changes in policy beyond that, and they pretty much all go in one direction. So with that, I'll turn it over to Louise. Do you see my slides? Great. Okay, so thanks, Alan. So yeah, now I'm gonna to turn to the fiscal outlook of the state and local sector. So the big difference between the state and local sector uh, and the federal government is that state and locals are subject to balanced budget requirements. Now the stringency of balanced budget requirements does vary across the states, but by and large, we can think that revenue losses must be offset by spending cuts or tax increases in, in relatively short order. So these are obviously a drag on the economy, impeding the economic recovery, and they also make it hard to provide essential services. There is a wide range of projected state and local revenue losses in the literature over the next two years. They vary from 130 billion to 875 billion. Now, to some extent, um, those vary because of different economic assumptions, uh, differences in which, whether talking about income taxes or income and sales taxes or a wider array of taxes and the methodology. Um, but still, most of those estimates are from historical relationships between macro variables and tax collections, like a regression of the change in the unemployment rate on change in tax collection. But this recession is really different. 
Um, first of all, unemployment is unusually concentrated among low-income workers. That means for any given level of unemployment, the wage losses and hence the revenue losses are lower. Second, a lot of the aid that we just heard about in terms of the federal aid has been in taxable forms. So not all states, but many states do tax unemployment insurance. So that extra $600 a week was also sort of shoring up taxable, a rev, taxable income for states. And PPP, which we'll hear about more later, but to the extent that PPP didn't increase employment, if it did increase employment, it's in our unemployment statistics, but to the extent it just went to firms that would otherwise have kept going, it's gonna shore up profits, which will also shore up taxes. On the other hand, there's really very different consumption patterns. You know, consumption fell really sharply in some areas, not because of insufficient demand, but because of social distancing. That has implications for sales taxes and fees. And importantly, so far at least, there's been no stock market downturn. Of course, there was a huge downturn, but we, that recovered swiftly. So if this holds, that means that capital gains revenues are gonna hold up. So we think that rather than um, looking to the past, we would do something that we call our bottom up approach. And what that basically means is we're trying to calculate what's gonna happen to each tax base and then directly calculate the taxes that should come from that. We use data from Opportunity Insights, among other sources, which track state by state, consumption by category, that means like consumption at grocery stores, hotels, restaurants, stuff like that, and employment by wage group. They have the lowest quartile, the middle two quartiles, and the high income quartile, which will give us uh, some, some pretty decent estimates of the distributional impacts across states of the, um, of the unemployment. We extend these data using CBO economic projections for the degree of social distancing, unemployment, wages, and consumption. What I mean by degree of social distancing, some of the consumption items that fell really, really sharply, um, we think are not related to sort of overall consumption, but to social distancing. In CBO's projection, they have that basically uh, sort of phase out by the middle of next year. We do the same with our tax base, but and, and basically end up being more like a typical recession rather than something special. Um, so what do we do? So for income shocks, we basically are creating a small micro simulation. We take the CPS, we run it through the NBR's tax sim to calculate pre-COVID tax liabilities, and then we shock it with our unemployment um, and the lower wages and capital income and CBO's projection. We compute unemployment insurance for each state, taking account of the extra $600 and the duration of unemployment and how many people would have gotten that, and feed it again through tax sim to calculate post-COVID tax liabilities. For sales taxes and other taxes and fees, we basically look at the data on consumption so far and extended by CBO, look at each state's rules for what's taxed and what isn't taxed and their sales tax or their fees and compute the actual tax collections and how much they're gonna fall. And then we also account for federal aid to state and local governments. Okay, so this is a summary of our results for the nation as a whole. Um, we are in everything I show you today, excluding higher ed and hospitals. The paper has them. We think they're sort of different and separable, which we explain in the paper. Um, but for now, I'm gonna show you excluding higher ed and public hospitals. So our projected declines in revenues are 155 billion this year, 167 billion next year, 145 billion in 2022. You can see that these don't decline very much over time. That comes from our taking on the CBO projection and Doug will have more to say about that. So I'll leave it to him. If we look at the, the components, you can see the personal income tax revenues declined $22 billion this year, 37 next year. Uh, that's a lot smaller than what many people would have expected. Um, on the other hand, if you look at the sales tax revenues and the other taxes and fees, those are quite large. One of the things that we found was interesting is if you look at uh, other taxes and fees and look at what is related to transportation, that's tolls, gas tax, airport fees. We lose $45 billion in 2020 related to transportation alone. Um, we have a line in this table called additional demands on spending and we have no numbers for it, but we wanted to put it on there to make clear that you need to think about that. So you can think about revenues, but spending is also different this recession um, and we need to know what that might be to understand what kind of fiscal stress. I'll return to that. Then we have state aid. So state aid amounts to $212 billion this year, 19 next year, nine the year after. Most of that aid is just, is coming from the coronavirus relief fund, which is $150 billion. Um, we have K through 12 and transit aid. And then what we have for Medicaid is basically our estimate of the difference between the higher Medicaid funding coming from a higher match, less the higher Medicaid spending that states should be expected to spend because of the recession, because of unemployment. 
Um, so are these numbers crazy? We think not. Um, so here we have recent data collected by the Urban Institute. This is from 41 states of, of tax collections thus far um, for the three, th three big uh, categories, personal income, corporate income, and general sales. If you look in April and the spring in general, you see these, these collections plummeted. And there were a lot of stories in the media about how collections had plummeted. That turns out to be mostly because of timing. There were a lot of delays. So when the federal government delayed their, their April 15th that the states took it on, there was also delays in uh, estimated payments. So there were a lot of delays um, that the states took on the federal government had done. And those were mostly made up or they were made up by July. So if you look at July, that's giving you a better read. Um, and if you look at July, you can see that personal income and, and general sales taxes are about four or 5% below last year. Um, uh, and the corporate is about 10. So the corporate's bigger than ours, the sales is smaller, but it's really very similar. You see these are moderate declines, they're not nothing. And remember, this is relative to last year, not relative to a pre-COVID baseline. Our numbers are relative to a pre-COVID baseline. But so they're moderate numbers, but they're not the huge numbers that some people have talked about. Now, we do this state by state and uh, tax base by tax base, and all of that detail is in the table. And you can see that the overall revenue loss is very tremendously across the states. So the states with the largest declines have between six and a half to 10%. Um, you know, some of these numbers look familiar to what we saw this morning about sort of the, the activity um, that you've seen. So they're related to what's happened to activity in the state, uh, as well as some other things. Um, so Nevada, Washington, California, Florida, New York, the states with the smallest declines, Wyoming, Mississippi, New Hampshire, and Kansas. This is declines in uh, general revenue, own source revenues. The federal aid also varies tremendously. And you can see that states with the most aid are the small states. Uh, and the states with the least aid are some of the ones I just mentioned at having the biggest revenue losses. Why the states with the most aid these small states? Because that $150 billion coronavirus fund specified that at a minimum states should get $1.25 billion. Um, and so that was a lot of money for these smaller states. And so you can see that they are, they basically got grants of, you know, 15 to 20 two percent of their general revenue so very large grants okay so really to, to, to wrap it up in a way much about how we should think about this to measure fiscal stress so federal aid and acts to date does cover revenue losses this year but not next year or thereafter and knowing this states will likely cut back on spending furthermore aid is much more generous relative to needs in smaller states leaving some states facing shortfalls even without accounting for future years or spending needs but from a macroeconomic perspective Maintaining spending means the sector is not a drag on the economy. So that's a reasonable thing to look at from a macro perspective. But we think from a public service perspective, the ability to maintain pre-COVID spending is not the right metric for measuring fiscal stress. So if spending needs go up significantly for public health, virtual schooling, remedial schooling after uh, the social distancing is over, then states will be under stress and have to cut necessary services. The state and local government seeing fiscal stress in coming years without additional aid may not be willing to spend adequately. So you can't really look at what states are spending um, to say, well, they don't need any money because they're not spending any money, right? So, so one of the reasons we don't give a bottom line of like, this is the measure of fiscal stress is we don't know enough about those spending needs, but we hope we have presented enough sort of pieces of information that can contribute to that discussion. So thank you very much. Thanks, Louise um, and Alan. That was really informative. Um, we'll have comments now from Doug Holtzikin. Thanks, Jan. Um, I want to thank, um, you know, uh, Alan, Bill, Byron, and, and Louise for providing um, two outstanding papers, um, both of which are uh, uh, extremely detailed, very careful, exhaustive looks at uh, the fiscal conditions at the federal and at the state level, they're also incredibly timely uh, for policymakers. And I, it's, it's not often the case that you get the combination of, of detail and, and, uh, and excellent empirical work with the timeliness. So I think they really are to be congratulated. Um, you know, as Alan said, um, they look at these three different um, baselines before and after on current law and then uh, the, the current policy baseline to try to get the answer to two questions, uh, what is the, the, uh, the fiscal outlook and how much did COVID-19 change the fiscal outlook? Um, you know, the short version of this is exactly as he said, the, the, the outlook is bad. Um, you know, over the next 10 years, um, we saw this sharp swelling of the near-term deficit due to the response in the CARES Act in particular, uh, primary deficit over 14% of GDP. Uh, we go past the levels of debt relative to GDP uh, that we experienced in World War II 
Uh, and um, all of that um, sort of begins to snowball as, as you go forward so that you see the primary deficits uh, rise toward the end of the 30 year projection to uh, uh, a little under 5% of GDP, but you see the interest uh, um, costs uh, exceed 7% of GDP, even with the low uh, interest rates that um, uh, Alan mentioned. So uh, as you go forward, uh, they get the debt to GDP ratio rising to 190% uh, of GDP. Um, all of that um, uh, is unsustainable. It's continuing to rise even at the end of the projection period. Um, if you then turn to um, the, the issue of uh, a current policy baseline, I, I just want to emphasize what Alan said sort of qu quietly, which is they, they've taken a fairly conservative view of, of what uh, constitutes extending current provisions that would increase the deficit. You know, my own view is that the current policy of the, of the Congress is to only pass laws that expand the deficit and raise the debt. And so the current policy baseline is essentially unbounded. We have no idea. Um, uh, uh, if they continue current behavior, how large it could get. Um, now, the, the second part of the question is, um, you know, how much of this do you get to, to blame on COVID-19? And, and I, I think the paper really uh, has two, two really important results that just jump out to me, at least. Uh, the first is essentially the fact that the Congress reacted in an, uh, an appropriately large fashion to the, the shock in the second quarter and ballooned the deficit, but it didn't do uh, what Rahm Emanuel would have encouraged them to do, which is take advantage of this emergency to do things that they want to do on a permanent basis. It's a genuinely transitory impact on the federal budget, gone within three years with both spending and, and revenues uh, returning to baseline. Now, they may yet pass more legislation, we'll see, but I, I think that that's actually a, a really remarkable result and, and something worth highlighting. The second is this is a, a huge demonstration in the power of lower interest rates. Uh, Alan showed you that chart about how CBO lowered its interest rate projections. It has an enormous impact on, on, the, on the outlook. Um, over the first 10 years, the interest rate reductions uh, offset the cost of the CARES package. Um, they're just as big a, re a response from COVID-19 as was the policy response. And, and I think that's a, a really important um, uh, point to take away. The, the paper sheds light on two very important policy issues uh, that are uh, intimately related. Alan didn't talk about their measures of fiscal gap, which are uh, how much do you have to change the primary deficit now and in every year to hit a debt to GDP target in some future year, say 2050. Um, they, they demonstrate these. They're very large um, fiscal changes necessary to hit uh, these these uh, debt uh, to GDP targets, say 100% or something like that. And so they they are a good way to parameterize the cost of delay, the cost of doing nothing, because that fiscal gap measure goes up the longer you wait to hit any particular debt to GDP target. And we're going to have to have a serious discussion about at what level the U.S. will stabilize the federal debt relative to GDP. Uh, in the 21st century, it has not stabilize the debt relative GDP and a minimum nation for a sovereign, a minimum condition for a sovereign nation is to be able to do that. And um, uh, we're going to find out that doing that is, is hard work. And the paper lays that out, I think, very, very clearly. In a related fashion, the more you uh, wait and the larger the debt gets, the more sensitive this entire uh, exercise is to the interest rates that are that are in there. And so um, the, the U.S. federal budget is now extremely uh, sensitive to interest rate fluctuations and uh, if you're at all risk averse about how that outlook um, uh, will, will, will turn out, um, you might want to um, uh, stabilize the debt at a lower level to, to reduce that interest sensitivity. But on the whole, um, I, you know, I, I would love to have some some horrible Achilles heel to this analysis that I could point out and tell you don't bother to read it, but you should read every page. It's a fantastic paper and, and, and very timely um, to boot. Uh, let me turn to the state and local piece um, uh, that Louise walked through. Um, I think this is also a, a great read, um, and, and, and here's why. I thought they did a great job of sort of identifying how different this economic downturn has been from previous 21st century financial bubbles wreck the real economy or 21st century industrial style inventory recessions. Um, th this is a different phenomenon. Uh, it, its dynamics are very different. 
its impact on tax bases as a result can't help but be different. And they they really do lay that out. They also do some some very simple empirical work that that sort of teaches you, yeah, you really don't want to just extrapolate from from past history. And instead, you ought to buy into the bottoms up uh, approach that they have. I, I thought that was all entirely convincing. Um, the bottoms up approach is exhaustive. Uh, the, the large um, micro sim model that they put together uh, is incredibly impressive. They had to do that on a state by state basis. Um, I, I just congratulate them. It's an enormous amount of work. The care with which they um, uh, do the, the sort of exercise of figuring out where the $600 went for, how long it went, what was, how long was your spell, uh, where are you in the income distribution since the progressivity of income taxes differs, um, I think they, they should be applauded for. It really does um, uh, give them a tool that they're going to be able to use for a long time to come, past COVID-19. This is a fantastic um, exercise. Comparable effort on the sales tax front. Uh, as Louise mentioned, I, I, I did want to, to sort of just highlight something. Um, and that the, the highlighting is um, that they rely on the, the CBOs before January and after July economic projections uh, to give them their measure of the shock that comes from uh, COVID-19. Uh, so for, in the income tax, the primary shock is to the unemployment rate. And um, you know, in simple terms, you get more unemployment, those people don't get wages, there's no wages to tax. And so it feeds into their, um, their uh, personal income tax micro sim. Theirs is much more elaborate, but but at the base of it is the the sort of nature of the shock. And and the thing I want to highlight is that if you just look at before and after, um, CBO predicted that unemployment would get very high, above ten percent, and stay up for quite a while. That's the blue line on on the left at the top. Um, in fact, it's it's so high that even right now it looks like a preposterously large shock, and the authors don't want to use it. And, and I think they're right about that. So what they did is the orange line. They just sort of uh, took where we are, extended it out till it hit the CBO um, uh, projections, and then followed the, the path out for the remainder of their forecast um, uh, interval out to the end of 2022. I, I just want to highlight that that essentially bakes in very little labor market improvement uh, through the middle of uh, 2021, and, and, and then the slow improvement thereafter. And it, it's, it, it struck me that you could use the same CBO data and, and get a different one by just simply saying, okay, we know if you get the unemployment rate um, to, to somewhere you know, around uh, uh, the shock to somewhere around five, then, then it's gonna um, uh, go forward in a particular way and just sort of shift the whole thing over to the left. And, and it would give you smaller shocks uh, during every quarter essentially and would, would make these smaller. I, I'm not arguing that I'm right. I'm almost never right. Um, I'm just saying that um, uh, it seems to me that th it could be quite sensitive to what you think about these paths and um, uh, given enough time, and they would need a lot more time, you could do some sensitivity analysis to see just how much my concern matters that might not turn out to be that big a deal. Um, there's, a, there's a comparable issue going on in the, the um, uh, shock to personal consumption expenditures. So nominal PCE is the, the underlying shock that would drive lower sales tax uh, receipts and also because of their structure, many of the fees that they estimate, these turned out to be the big tickets in, the, in, their, in their estimates. Um, and so I just, you know, I, I got curious. I thought I should just see what this thing looks like. The top line was the January projection for PCE. The bottom line's the, the July and the shock never goes away. And so that these are uh, over, the, over the forecast period, right? So, so the, there's, there's um, a feeling in, the, in my gut that these are sort of upper bound kind of estimates because of the, the lack of improvement that, that's in the underlying CBO. Um, I, I do think it was, it was you know, a sensible choice to go to, to a, an independent third party for measures of the shocks. I, I, I endorse that, but um, you know, it does give you this result. Um, so it's worth knowing that's underneath these estimates. Uh, things I'd close with, um, you know, the, the underlying state by state heterogeneity is enormous. Um, you know, if you, you see it in the in the the revenues, probably driven a lot by whether you were uh, heavily reliant on tourism to collect a lot of those uh, taxes. If you look at those states, those are tour, tourism states. So travel, hospitality, leisure taking a big hit, uh, they're going to get hurt. And for those small states getting a lot of money, that's called the U.S. Senate, and everybody gets two senators and that's life. Um, so, but it, it does mean that the fiscal stresses are going to be very different across uh, these states, and, and that's important. Um, 
the 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 one thing that I'll just flag um, um, it, it gets into the imponderables that Louise closed with about what is the real fiscal stress. Um, uh, if you really have a world that looks like that CDO PCE chart, where you're just never going to go back to to what the world looked like in January of 2020, do you want to permanently prop it up, or do you want to say to the states, you know, it's a new world and you need to uh, recalibrate your, your fiscal structure for this new world. And you, we, we can't be reliant on filling in that hole at the federal level. And, and that's, a, that, that's not answerable by the, the paper, but it sure provides a lot of information about how you want to think about uh, the kinds of dollars that are in play um, uh, in, in sort of resolving what we do going forward. So um, I, I'm just going to close there, um, emphasize again that I think these are um, really well done papers. Um, the, the broader audience will not know the ridiculous timetables on which they were actually uh, done. Uh, so I congratulate the authors for doing that uh, without killing each other. So that was great. And um, I'll turn it back to you, Jen. Okay, thanks, Doug. Uh, and thanks to uh, Ellen and Louise for, for the presentation as well. Um, just to remind everyone, if you'd like to ask a question, uh, you can put your hand up in the um, uh, attendee list, um, or if you can put a question into chat or into the Q&A. So we have some hands up already. I'm going to start with Ellen Blinder, followed by Olivier Blanchard. Okay, did I unmute myself? You did. Okay, in addition to congratulating Louise and Alan, as Doug did for this incredibly useful, I mean, not all work is useful. This is very useful stuff. I have a sort of semi-specific question, which is this. Um, reasonable, if you're starting to forecast the near-term economy, I'm not going after 2050, um, the course of the pandemic is going to be critical, a critical input. So I'd like you to just say a little bit, a word or two about what that, um, what the CBO assumed in the near term and whether that's reasonable. But more pointedly, picking up on what Doug said, for Louise, one thing we have seen very dramatically is the course of the pandemic has varied enormously state by state. Really enormous. I show this to my students in lecture. Uh, it's, it's really quite incredible. Uh, the, the curve for uh, New York looks like the mirror image of the curve for Florida, for example, like they were other ends of the world. And uh, what are you assuming about that or can you take that into account? Thank you. Okay, uh, Olivia. Uh, I, was, I was struck by an apparent tension between the numbers that uh, that Alan gave and Louise gave. I mean, Alan said, if I got it right, that we would be down to 2% deviation from, from a deficit at the end of uh, fiscal year 2020. And Louise showed three numbers for the decline in revenues, uh, in, in revenue uh, for 2020, 2021, and 2022, which were more or less constant. And there seems to be a tension there. Maybe it's because in 2020, there's a lot of federal subsidies to the states or something. But I, we need to clarify. In one case, it looks like we're going back to something fairly good. In the other case, it looks like it's it's forever. So to, I, I may be missing something, but if you can clarify, it would be great. Thank you. OK. Uh, and the next uh, question from Bob Gordon. There can you go. hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you now. You should be unmuted. Okay. Um, I wanted to uh, call attention to an issue that has to do with the state and local governments. Um, if you look at uh, personal consumption expenditures as a, a leading indicator of tax revenue, uh, in July, PCE was only 5% below February. And that looks like the problem is fairly minor and is soon to go away. But if you think about mass transit, if you think about public transit, there are systems from the New York subway to the New York commuter railroads to the Chicago commuter railroads where business is down 75 to 80%. And this of course 
drives up revenue by an equivalent percent. So th these are smoking time bombs in terms of who is going to bail out uh, the nation's public transit. Um, and I would urge the authors to make a special, at least short section on this additional problem and whether they consider this part of the state and local deficit issue. Okay, and uh, we have a question in uh, Q&A um, from Mark Mazur um, that uh, is asking about the data on uh, federal revenue. So this is a question for the, um, the federal side of the house uh, focused to Ellen Auerbach. So says that the, the figure that you showed that has federal revenues dropping by half a percent seems like a small change, um, but Mark wants to compare that um, instead of to the previous year, compare it to expected revenues. Uh, so that expected revenues were increased to, or expected to increase by 4%. Um, so he thinks, you know, we should be thinking of that as a, a larger drop in revenues than what your, your data uh, said. So um, I know you, you answered that in the chat, but it seems like a question for the, for the larger group. Um, okay. Um, why don't you answer some of these questions that we have so far? They're pretty detailed. And uh, if we have more questions, we, we might have a little time to go back. Okay, um, <clears throat> let me go first. Um, in answer to uh, a comment Doug made about it, that it, it being unfortunate that uh, we didn't take Rahm Emanuel's advice and uh, okay. take advi advance, uh, advantage of the crisis, um, I, I think if we had done so, it would have gone in the in the other direction. Uh, I, I assume you were thinking about some sort of restructuring of entitlement programs or something like that, or maybe tax reform or something that would have um, closed the longer term primary deficits. But if I, if I think about what kind of a, a push would have been coming from the crisis, it would have been for much st stronger social safety net spending. Um, and not just in the short run, which is what we had, but in the longer run because of a perception that, that these programs like Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, which were already popular, uh, are, would be even uh, more popular um, in, in light of, uh, of the, sh the kind of shock that we've had. So um, I, I think it, in, in a sense, it's probably a good thing uh, that we, we, we kept the response to the short run. I wasn't clear. I, I agree with you. And, and just in Mark Mazur's point, yeah, I, I mentioned in passing that uh, the denominator went down, uh, and so the, the uh, both both uh, the increase in uh, spending and and uh, the re reduction in revenues relative to GDP weren't uh, you know measured exactly right. But it's still true uh, that the I mean, in fact, the decline in revenues is probably smaller as Louise mentioned at the state level. The, the decline in revenues is probably smaller than it, we would have expected given the increase in the unemployment rate because the composition of uh, job losses is different in this recession than, than in other ones. Uh, so it's it's still true that uh, for, for uh, compared to other recessions, the changes are, are much bigger on the spending side than on the revenue side, certainly in absolute terms and also relative to the best recession. Let me just add one thing quickly about Alan's, uh, Alan, Palinder's point about the course of the pandemic. Uh, we have some sensitivity analysis in the paper. I'm always surprised at how little variations in the growth rate affect uh, future debt, future deficit. And the reason, the reason they have relatively small effects is that if the growth rate goes down, the interest rate goes down. And so you save on net interest payments. Uh, in contrast, uh, the budget outlook is very sensitive uh, to the level of the interest rate. Uh, so the course of the pandemic definitely the the uncertainty definitely has an impact on certainty of the budget outlook, uh, but most of it comes from uh, the level of interest rates rather than the level of output. Louise, did you want to respond to any questions about the state and local or or Byron? Byron's going to respond. Yeah, I'll, I'll take it first, and I can pass it off to Louise. Uh, first, I just want to say, say a major thanks to Doug for the very kind and uh, generous comments. 
Uh, I'll respond to his major concern with the state and local section of the paper, which is that the CBO projection, the economic projection on which we're pinned to is too pessimistic. Uh, you know, the bottom line here is I think we agree. You know, there are very good reasons to use the CBO projection. It's the gold standard. It's very detailed and granular. And as a good part of the aim of the state and local portion of the paper was to develop this bottom-up methodology, uh, the granularity helps. Uh, it's also the case, I would note, that although the CBO projection has kind of gone off the rails quickly in the near term, over the broad three years that we use it for the state and local portion of the paper, that could well prove to be more accurate. For instance, a second wave scenario might generate that. But again, we very much agree with Doug. The CBO projection currently is well outside the sort of consensus of most private sector forecasters. And the first order of business for the paper is some sensitivity analysis. And the first item there is to you know, use something closer to the private sector consensus uh, right now. So thank you for that. We'll do that. Uh, I'll just mention in response to Alan Blinder's comment about the course of the pandemic, the CBO does have very specific assumptions about that in terms of its effect on social distancing. They have it gradually abating away and totally being gone by the second half of 2021. And for many of the state and local estimates, we've pinned to that very precisely. So for things like transportation spending, motor fuel taxes and so forth, we're, we're pinned to those CBO assumptions pretty tightly. Uh, I'll pivot from there to what I think, I think it was Bob Gordon's comment about the transit authorities. You know, the transit authorities are indeed in many places ha have suffered just historic collapses in their revenue. You know, we're doing everything at the state level combined for state and local governments together. We do capture these collapses. In fact, one of the most surprising thing about our results is if you look at the other taxes and fees, which are usually not a focus of analysis in terms of cyclicality of the state and local sector, that, that those uh, declines have been massive. And that's almost wholly driven by the decline in transportation activity. And the biggest place you see there are some of the transit authorities. Uh, so we could emphasize that more because the, the comment that was made very much does line up with what the results in the paper. Uh, I'll, I'll leave it at that unless Louise would like to say anything further. I have a few comments. So um, going back to this idea of the transit and the, the variation across the state, I just want to emphasize that we start with data through August or September about actual consumption and actual vehicle miles driven. Um, and so we start with the very big differences across the state and then just have sort of the shocks kind of like go down as social distancing goes down so that the big, so New York is definitely hit more, much more. And we, and we capture that. So the only thing we're using CBO is to, to get back from where we start to sort of where we end, number one. Number two, this will also address Olivia's point. So one of the things we do is we're using nominals. So, so CBO has lowered inflation a lot. So although nominal consumption never gets back, real consumption, real GDP do, but nominals never do because we just have this two years of really, really low inflation. So you might think that in some sense, our numbers again are an overestimate. If you think the price level of the things that state and local governments are buying um, would also go down and therefore you really kind of want to look at the reals. And we first started with the reals and then I went to the nominals. I wasn't sure which way to do it, but there is that really is a very big difference. And that's part of the reason. So when Olivia noticed that difference, ours are nominal dollars and Alan's is relative to GDP. So first of all, GDP is lower, but nominal GDP is, is so that gets rid of the nominal issue once you divide by something. Um, so uh, that's that's part of it. I, I think we that's have it. two minutes at the end here and, and Martin Bailey was waiting to ask a, a question. Um, Martin, are you still there? Or did your question well, get no, answered? I, I, I wasn't sure there was any time since we've got two minutes. I'll, I'll I, I have two minutes. Yeah, go ahead. Quick. quick. Um, so uh, during the, the Great Recession, I was on a panel with uh, Doug and somebody in the audience asked the question, was there any concern about whether foreigners would be willing to continue to buy U.S. debt? And Doug responded that we were the favorite horse in the glue factory. Um, <laughs> which is a line that I've used uh, myself uh, on, on subsequent occasions. So my, my question is, did, did you uh, sort of look at to what extent, I mean, it's fashionable these days to say, you know, that not exactly that debt doesn't or deficits don't matter, but they don't, as long as interest rates stay low, uh, but there could potentially be an unstable cycle where um, 
we were not able to finance as easily uh, the, the deficits over such a long period and, and interest rates start to rise. So I wondered if you had examined the other international side of it, who is providing all this money? Is that a blessing as it keeps the world economy going or at some point are we gonna run into a constraint? For raising that, uh, one minute for the lightning round. Who, who wants to take on that question? Uh, I'll say something about that. Uh, in the early 2000s, uh, foreigners bought a fairly large share of incremental debt. Uh, the last decade, they bought a much lower share, uh, and it's been mainly purchased uh, by Americans. Uh, I don't foresee uh, likelihood of a fiscal crisis or us being able, unable to finance our debt uh, any time in the horizon that, that we've looked at. Uh, if there's an issue, it's a political issue, uh, not an economic issue. All right, thanks very much, everybody. That was a really interesting uh, session, great discussion, great paper. Um, we're gonna flip over, so we'll uh, turn over the panel uh, to the next paper. And while we do that, we'll give Ethan a chance to uh, share his slides here. Uh, and the, the next paper will focus on international issues. The title is whether or will the secular decline in exchange rate and inflation volatility survive COVID-19? Um, the presentation will be by Ethan Ilzetsky. Thank you. Uh, can you see my slides now? We can and we can hear you. Okay, great. Um, so thanks, uh, Janice, uh, for the invitation. This is joint work with uh, Carmen Reinhardt and Ken Rogoff. And in previous work, we've shown that there has been a, um, a decline over the first two uh, decades of the 21st century in the volatility of core uh, global uh, exchange rates. And when we first proposed this paper to uh, 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 Janice and Jim, we uh, thought we'd be talking today about how this stability has collapsed. Uh, and in fact, it's shown remarkable resilience. Um, so this paper instead will be talking about the, will be documenting this uh, trend in uh, exchange rate stability and the decline in exchange rate, exchange rate volatility um, and take a first stab at trying to understand where it comes from and how it successfully uh, survived the enormous volatility in the real economy and in um, uh, other asset markets. So this first slide shows um, the uh, absolute value of the month on month percent change in the US dollar euro uh, exchange rate where the euro is replaced by the German Deutschmark before 1999. So that was a mouthful, but um, to put to make it simple, this is simply an indicator of uh, exchange rate volatility uh, for that uh, exchange rate. And what we can see is that from 1975 till August 2020, there has been a secular decline in the degree of exchange rate volatility. But this figure shows two uh, other more recent phenomena. One is that since around 2014, and I'll revisit that date later, um, we see a further sharp decline even relative to that secular trend. And second, um, US recessions are indicated in gray bars here. And you can see that in each US recession, exchange rate volatility goes up. During COVID-19, although this was the sharpest uh, uh, recession on record, we see no resurgence of exchange rate uh, volatility. So that's where that's the, the source of our surprise here. Um, this figure shows the same facts for the US dollar yen exchange rate. Again, the trend decline in volatility, the further sharp decline in volatility since 2014, and the uh, lack of volatility uh, during COVID. These facts are even more striking when we compare the volatility in exchange rates 
to the volatility of other asset prices. Um, so that this is not merely, this is not something about asset prices more generally, it's specifically about exchange rates. So this gives the euro versus dollar exchange rate volatility, this time uh, compared to, um, relative to uh, the prices of, the volatility of the prices of other assets. So when we compare to oil prices or um, a basket of commodities, or stock uh, market uh, valuations, we can see again the secular decline in exchange rate volatility in relative terms, and even more striking sharp decline in volatility since 2014, and an even further decline in volatility in relative volatility during COVID-19 to the extent that March of this year was the lowest reading of exchange rate volatility relative to um, other asset prices. And in recent years, we've been seeing levels of relative volatility that are very similar to those seen in the 1960s when we had a system of fixed exchange rates uh, under Bretton Woods. Um, so you might think that the Chinese renminbi will buck this trend. And indeed, if you look at the green line here, that shows that same metric now for the US dollar renminbi exchange rate. And the renminbi was, had a hard peg to the dollar in the early 21st century, and that peg has been loosened over time. So not surprisingly, we do see an increase in dollar renminbi uh, volatility. The less obvious fact is that that increase in renminbi dollar volatility has been matched roughly one-to-one -one with a decline in the volatility of the renminbi relative uh, to other core exchange rate uh, uh, currencies, like here in blue shown the euro, but also the Japanese yen, which isn't shown on this figure. So when we look at the um, what we call the G4 currencies, the dollar, the yen, uh, the euro, and the renminbi, that reflect more than 50% of world GDP, we have remarkable exchange rate stability at the core of the system, which has been showing um, a gradual decl uh, decline in volatility and enormous resilience to uh, COVID-19. Um, the paper provides some of the more technical details. I won't get into them uh, right here. I'll just point out that the trends I describe are statistically significant in panel regressions, and that when we try to date that break in 2014, um, we find that it's in August 2014, a date that I'll repeat later, um, using formal buy and per own uh, uh, breakpoint tests. Um, so just to summarize kind of the, 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 the initial observations, um, we refer to the uh, 21st century exchange rate system as the extended Bretton Woods II, extended because it uh, encompasses a larger part of the globe than the uh, original uh, Bretton Woods system did. And we find that in the core currencies in the system, volatility has trended down. Uh, seen a further decline in 2014 and has been remarkably stable during COVID-19. So the obvious question is what has caused uh, these trends? And our main hypothesis is that the decline in exchange rate volatility is a side effect of a decline in the uh, uh, variability of inflation uh, across countries. Uh, uh, and a decline in the variability of short and long-term interest rates um, across countries. So let me document those uh, facts in the following slides. Um, <clears throat> this first chart uh, in red shows the median inflation rate for uh, um, high-income countries um, since the Second World War, and it documents the very familiar fact that inflation rates have declined um, and are now ver at very low rates. Um, the gray bars uh, documents a slightly more subtle point, which is that also the variability, it shows the standard deviation of inflation across those same high income countries. And it shows that the decline in the, um, in the average rate of inflation has been matched with a decline in the variability of inflation across countries to the point that, you know, in, in historical terms, there is essentially no inflation differentials across countries. Now, if you think about exchange rate determination through the lens of a purchasing power 
um, parity theory, um, if there's no changes in uh, price levels across countries, there's no pressure on the exchange rate to adjust to, uh, to uh, restore parity in relative prices across countries. Now, purchasing power parity in the data holds only really in long terms, and even there the evidence is somewhat mixed, and so we don't think this is the main story of what's going on. Rather, we think that the declining interest rate differentials across countries, possi you know, possibly as a consequence of those declining inflation differentials across countries, um, plays a more important role. So in the black line here, we see the standard deviation of the uh, monetary policy interest rate across the central banks issuing the top uh, 10 currencies in terms of trade volume. And we can see that in the global financial crisis, the variability of policy interest rates um, was very com uh, compressed substantially. But this has declined even further in the, in the decade that followed the crisis and um, collapsed even further during COVID-19 to the point that essentially now there's really no variability across interest rate, policy interest rates across countries because nine out of 10 of these um, uh, uh, central banks are at zero or negative uh, rates. But these facts hold not only for short-term interest rates, they hold also for longer term uh, interest rate differentials. So this figure shows um, a histogram, so the uh, distribution of 10-year um, bond yields for high-income countries, and each of these lines shows a different time period. Um, the, uh, if we take the uh, 50s and 60s of Bretton Woods as sort of a benchmark, we can see that um, in the 70s, there was a larger, there was a in, large increase in long-term interest rate variability across um, in uh, across uh, advanced economies that persisted um, well into the 90s. Now, as we enter the 21st century, there's a massive compression of long-term interest rate uh, differentials um, uh, in advanced economies to the point, again, that when we arrive uh, at the, the latest readings, we see essentially no differences in long-term yields across countries. Um, and this is partially, uh, of course, because many of these yields, 50% uh, of these yields, half of these countries have zero or slightly negative 10-year uh, yields. Now, if you'll recall that August 2014 date at which we've dated the downward break in uh, volatility, um, that is roughly the, the time, June 2014, when the European Central Bank uh, started experimenting with negative interest rates. And the following year saw um, uh, core Eurozone, Eurozone uh, bond yields and Japanese bond yields um, start hitting zero and eventually even negative territory. Um, so now if you think um, about exchange rate determination through the lens of, um, of uh, an uncovered interest rate parity relationship, whereby exchange rates are adjusting to compensate for interest rate differentials uh, 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 in bonds uh, of different uh, uh, currencies, um, then with no differentials in long-term interest rates and you know, no, no expectation uh, that interest rates will, um, will change, um, there is little scope uh, for uh, exchange rate volatility. So in the paper, we entertain a number of alternative hypotheses. Uh, I'm sure these will come up in, our, uh, in the discussion later on, but I want to dwell for one minute on the implications of these findings for economic theory. So mon um, exchange rate models of the 1970s uh, and 80s put monetary policy um, at the center of the discussion of exchange rate uh, volatility, uh, following Dornbush's overshooting model. Um, these have uh, been notoriously difficult to verify empirically. Um, and so the past decade or so have, has seen a move 
in economic theory to exchange rate models that focus on financial risks as uh, driving exchange rate volatility. Now, we view COVID-19 as a sort of casual, but I think a very powerful natural experiment where financial volatility and real volatility has been enormous, but there's been little, very little interest rate variability across countries. We, we've seen that exchange rate volatility is extremely muted in this period, which may be, you know, which can be seen as lending support for um, the earlier uh, vintage of theories uh, of exchange, where, that put monetary policy in the center. Um, so um, I want to spend my last uh, minute or so on what could uh, go wrong. So if um, the stability of Bretton Woods II has been undergirded by um, uh, low inflation variability across uh, countries, then the obvious risk to the stability of the international uh, monetary or uh, informal uh, international monetary arrangement is a resurgence of uh, inflation. And so we should recall that Bretton Woods, the, the Bretton Woods one, the original Bretton Woods, um, fell apart um, when inflation started to spike in the 1970s. So we should at least entertain the risk that uh, you know, inflation could uh, cause a resurgence uh, in volatility. Um, we have to recall that you know, alongside successes of monetary policy and monetary policy independence, um, you know, the past couple of decades, we've been riding uh, with some very favorable uh, uh, backwinds of downward price pressures due to globalization uh, and expansion of the effective labor force um, uh, that that uh, you know that may be coming to an end. And finally, I just want to to end on uh, a cautionary statement of not uh, making um, uh, 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 false analogies to the global financial crisis. This figure shows the 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 growth of monetary aggregates. Um, and um, during the global financial crisis that was deflationary, we did see that the massive quantitative easing of the time um, largely stayed on banks' balance sheets and didn't really translate into broader measures of money, of, of liquidity and credit. In contrast, uh, in this cycle, QE has translated into a, a, a um, unprecedented increase in uh, credit and liquidity growth. And so with this liquidity sloshing around, we, uh, you know, we view that as a, a you know, a pos something we need to consider in the set of risks uh, uh, going forward. Um, so we talk about some other risks in the paper, but um, I've run out of time. So let me um, just summarize. Uh, that we document a secular decline in the volatility of major exchange rates in the 21st century that has accelerated since 2014. And um, our, you know, our initial uh, view on this is that it has been caused by a decline in the volatility and variability of inflation and interest rates uh, across uh, countries. Uh, thanks. Thank you, Ethan. Um, very clear on uh, informative. Our comments uh, and the discussion will come from Sylvia Miranda Agrippino. Of her. Oh, I have to uh, stop sharing. Hello. Now. You're good, Ethan. Um, one second. Yeah, let me just. Ethan, I already did it. Okay. Okay, so can can you all see my screen and we can. my voice? And we can hear you. Great, Great. thank you. So uh, I want to start by thanking the organizers for inviting me to discuss this very insightful paper from which I learned a lot. And before I say anything, I actually want to stress that none of this is going to reflect in any way the official views of the Bank of England, but these are my very own um, personal views. So uh, as you've just heard, uh, this is a paper that, that really addresses a hugely important topic that is likely to stay uh, 
with us for some time. And really the question that, they, that they're asking is whether the COVID shock was large and potent enough um, to actually threaten the stability of the international monetary and financial system the way we know it. And the way in which the authors um, build their argument is essentially in three, in three steps. So first, they document um, that the uh, FX volatility among the major currencies has been trending down uh, and that this trend accelerated in 2014 and then again um, with COVID. Then they argue that uh, essentially this is, um, this is the result of um, somewhat a paralysis of monetary policy. And, and in particular, as you've heard of the, the fact that uh, inflation rates, short-term rates and particularly long-term rates have been trending down and, uh, and converging. Now, of course, this poses a risk because if you think that uh, you know, the, 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 the large effects of this COVID shock are gonna be uh, like a supply shock, then, then this will come with expectations of rising inflation and then perhaps due to that, um, expectations of monetary policy divergence. Um, so this could, uh, you know, could threaten, uh, could threaten this, this apparent stability in, um, in, uh, in exchange rates. So I was going to organize my comments around two uh, uh, main points. Uh, in the first, I want to offer perhaps a complementary view around the drivers of effects volatility over the past uh, 20 years or so. And here, my conclusions really are going to be that perhaps discarding risk cycles altogether may be a little bit of, of a risky strategy in this setting because it risks leaving aside what is perhaps an important, um, an important part of the story. And, uh, and I would argue then that uh, far from being affected by, by paralysis, uh, monetary policy actually was very active in taming risk, particularly during, uh, during the COVID crisis. Uh, in the second part of my discussion, I'm going to focus a little bit more on the past few months. And here I'm going to argue that uh, while in many respects the transmission of the COVID shock so far is not too different from any other previous uh, recession in the US, one thing that I think is actually quite different is the fact that this time around um, the US dollar is, up, is depreciating and against the broad basket of currencies. And I'm not gonna go so far as to identify the causes of this uh, depreciation, but I would show you some, some charts that probably point towards uh, more US uh, specific reasons for this, for this depreciation. And so perhaps, I mean, even if we remain in a low inflation, low interest rate world, there might be a sort of shorter term risk to the stability of the international financial system nonetheless. So let me start by looking at the effects volatility dynamics at the core. And to do this, I'm gonna actually step away a little bit from the longer term averages that, they, that are used in the paper. And I'm actually gonna uh, use data on um, estimated effects volatility that come from the volatility lab at NYU. Uh, so what I'm plotting here is the estimated uh, effects volatility of bilateral exchange rates of the Euro and the Japanese yen, both against the dollar. And these are in green and in red, whereas the blue line uh, on top is the uh, Deutsche Bank currency VIX index, which is essentially the VIX, but, but very specific for, for currencies. And I think what, 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 uh, what, what stands out here is two, probably two main things. The first is that actually the past 10 years or so have not been exactly, at least according to this uh, estimates, uh, a low volatility uh, regime. And in particular that, as you can see here, um, the COVID episode was actually quite, um, quite important. The second thing is that, uh, in fact, this, this currency VIX tracks the low frequency uh, movement in this, in this time series actually quite, actually quite well. And, and now if you were to um, add to the chart the more famous VIX, uh, which is the purple line, you'd see that, I mean, of course, there's a lot of noise in the daily data. There's, a, there's an obvious uh, difference in the scale here. But by and large, the correlation um, among the time profiles of this volatility indices is quite, uh, is quite apparent. So in this sense, I would probably uh, caution against discarding this, uh, this explanation altogether. Now, of course, I mean, the fact that um, 
I think uh, risk is important doesn't mean that dom domestic fundamentals are not important or it doesn't mean that monetary policy is altogether uh, irrelevant. And in fact, I would argue that um, the fact that the COVID episode wasn't as dramatic in terms of volatility of exchange rate, as dramatic and as long-lived as previous episodes, has to do with the fact that this time around central banks were actually ready and they, they responded in a, in a large and, and, and prompt way to the, uh, to the crisis uh, through a variety of, of programs. There is some evidence already that some of these programs have been actually quite successful in um, easing uh, conditions and in uh, lowering uh, risk levels, especially in, uh, in debt markets, both uh, public and uh, corporate. But what I think is perhaps more relevant for this uh, discussion is the fact that one of the programs was the reintroduction of, of swap lines. These were um, originally introduced during the um, during the global financial crisis. And as you can see here from the left hand side, um, since their reintroduction in March, they've been used massively. And now of course, I mean, we, we don't know enough about their effects on, on exchange rate and by, by no means they've been introduced with the explicit aim of, in, of you know, uh, managing currencies. But one might argue that by effectively relaxing supply constraints in, uh, in currency markets, they, they can have second round effects on exchange rates too. And as you can see here from on the right hand side, I mean, this is, um, you know, very, very simple, but I, at least visually, uh, it looks like these are all bilateral exchange rates against the dollar. At least visually, it looks like um, these markets were paying attention to, uh, to the announcement. So, in a sense, I mean, if you, if you think of uh, monetary policy as, as being sort of a broad set of tools, then it's not clear uh, that, that there hasn't been some, some uh, you know, um, that, that it was affected by either paralysis or inactivity, and that in fact, these interventions may have played um, an important role. So in what way do I think, um, that this, this crisis might in fact be a little bit different from what, uh, uh, from what we're used to, um, if you can ever get used to uh, a recession or a crisis. But so if you were to actually compare um, the way in which um, the COVID shock is transmitted uh, so far, um, it looks like in fact, uh, the, the, the transmission, I mean, it was obviously a very large shock, but then it doesn't look like at least so far that the transmission has been any different uh, than, than previous recessions. And so even if at the origin it's, it's, it's really a supply shock, it looks like the second round demand effects are actually, are actually dominating. And this is a view that, that seems to be shared uh, also by, by professional forecasters. So for example, if you look here, um, I mean, we've heard before about the, uh, the projections of the CBO, but if you look at the SPF as well, it looks like um, low, volati uh, low inflation states are actually being attached somewhat higher exempty probability of realization, both in the shorter term in 2021, but also if you go all the way um, to extend the forecast horizon to 10 years. So at least, um, you know, from this standpoint, it doesn't look like inflation risk might be, uh, might be that strong. And in a sense, even if you thought, uh, even if you thought differently, the fact that uh, the Fed is now operating under a different framework sort of breaks, uh, arguably breaks the link between expectations of higher volatility, of higher inflation and expectations of a monetary policy tightening. So taking all this together, my sense is that perhaps uh, inflation risk and risk of monetary policy divergence due to inflation might not be, uh, perhaps the primary, uh, the primary source of concern. There is one thing uh, that I would like to uh, highlight though, that I think is actually quite, quite interesting. And is that contrary to previous recession episodes, this time around the US dollar is actually depreciating quite markedly and against the broad basket of currencies. So you see it here, this is the dollar index. Um, so you see it quite clearly here that after the, the, the rally in March, then the US dollar sort of lost ground against, um, you know, against, against the currencies that, that enter the index uh, to, to quite low level. And of course, this is in, lar in large part, this is 
this is really a euro story. So if you look here at the bilateral exchange rate with the euro, you see this dramatic appreciation of the euro against the dollar, which you know has been occupying many headlines uh, over the past over the past couple of weeks, and perhaps many uh, uh, central bankers' thoughts. Uh, but really, this isn't just this isn't just a euro story. So if you were to look at the um, bilateral exchange rate with the British pound, you would see that in fact the, the, the situation is actually quite similar. So, so the dollar is actually is depreciating also against the British pound. And I, I would I would I would think that you know quite unlikely that the markets aren't um, paying attention to the the, the challenges. Uh, related to the negotiation of the exit of the UK from the European Union and all the risks and that this comes with. So, so in a sense, this is even more striking because the British pound is appreciating against the dollar despite this very large um, UK specific risk. So in this sense, I think that perhaps the, 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 the story behind this, this, US, this US dollar depreciation is really quite uh, US specific. Of course, you know, you, you could say maybe this is just completely temporary, maybe this is just due to some speculative positioning and we shouldn't make too much of it, um, which is fair. But perhaps, you know, there's equally some perhaps tiny but non-zero probability that this is actually signaling some sort of a shift in investors' appetite, perhaps away um, from US assets. So really, uh, where does that leave us? Well, it leaves us, I think, in a world which is actually quite different from what we were used to. So typically during recessions, during times of crisis, we are used to think of the US as the, uh, the world banker. I mean, this has been uh, studied before that typically what happens is that in times of crisis, you have the US dollar appreciating while other asset prices are, are, are losing value. This time around is actually is actually quite quite the opposite. And we have stock markets which are trading at a record high, and on the other hand, the dollar is depreciating. So perhaps I mean it's too it's too early to say whether this is anything to do with with a with a loss in confidence. Uh, but I would argue is that um, you know perhaps even if um, the immediate risks uh, do not come from inflation or um, accommodative monetary policy, which is gonna probably going to stay with us for some uh, for some years. There might be others, and perhaps you have specific, I mean, think uh, geopolitical uh, scenarios, think, think politics, which may threaten the stability of the system, even, uh, you know, might nonetheless. So this is all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvia. Um, it's very clear and really interesting. Um, we have uh, some questions from the audience. Let me start with Alan Blander. All right, did I unmute myself? You did. Okay, that worked a different way than before. Uh, I, very quickly, one is just an observation, um, a technical but simple uh, observation, which is, the basic explanation for the lower exchange rate volatility is the lower um, volatility of inflation and interest rates, which makes sense. But is it really true? And isn't it basically inevitable as the mean of a series goes down and down and down, which is true of the inflation and, in and nominal interest rate series, the um, standard deviation, which is what you use, must go down and down and down. It would be wild if it didn't. And wouldn't it be more illuminating maybe to look at the coefficient of variation? Uh, I, I, I did my mental calculator on a few of the numbers you put up, but uh, the mental calculator is not so accurate. It didn't look like the coefficient of variation of uh, interest rates was changing very much. It was that the level and the standard deviation were both going down pari passu. Uh, so that was one. The second, is maybe I could draw out Carmen or Ken. I've been wondering, as Sylvia has, about why no flight to quality. Uh, the flight, the panic flight seems to be going not to the United States as it always does. And I don't know why, but I'm just wondering if anybody thinks they know why. Thank you. Thank you, 
Thanks, Alan. Um, why don't I give uh, authors a chance to respond to Sylvia's remarks and to answer Alan's question. Uh, and we'll see if we have any other questions from the audience. Um, sure. Um, I, I'm actually going to share my uh, screen again. Uh, can you see the exchange rate levels? Yes. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I, I, on the issue of the, the dollar uh, depreciation, that's, that's correct. That's, you know, that's a correct fact. And I think it's an interesting uh, question. Maybe I will uh, let Carmen and Ken respond on their explanation for that. But I want to put this in a broader perspective. I mean, this is the level of the exchange rate as opposed to its volatility. And you can, you, you can, with the naked eye, you can see the decline in volatility. I mean, look at the gyrations of the euro or the yen over the past few decades. And then you come to 2014 and this is flatlined. So, you know, we're talking about this move compared to what's happening during the global financial crisis. It really is a very muted response. So, you know, we have to uh, put it in the perspective. Um, I also think this speaks to the swap line uh, point, which, you know, we discussed swap lines. We think they may have been uh, an important, uh, have played an important role. Um, but, you know, recall that our, our facts are not only about COVID-19. They, you know, what's happening here is something that starts before COVID-19, uh, well after the swap lines of the previous crisis were gone, and, you know, well before the swap crisis of COVID-19, the so swap lines of COVID-19 came into play. And so we think that, you know, the swap lines alone can't explain what's going on here, certainly not the break around 2014. Um, I also wanted to just um, uh, quickly sort of revisit this question of implied volatility that uh, Sylvia brought up, which is this is the, the same currency VIX, uh, implied volatility of currencies. And, um, you know, Sylvia emphasized the correct fact that this is very highly correlated with uh, uh, implied volatility of stocks, but, you know, uh, what we emphasize is really the level of the volatility, right? So while um, st the stock market shows, you know, one of the highest readings of volatility in 150 years, um, you know, we see a little blip in currency vol volatility, but it's comparable to what happened around 20, you know, the unmemorable, mo you know, month of uh, February 2016. <laughs> I mean, it's not, it's really nothing to speak of. So we do think there is something to say that, you know, uh, monetary policy um, stopped the, the volatility, we would have to explain uh, something that's specific to currency risk as opposed to, ge to generalized uh, risk, which, you know, swap lines fit that bill, but again, doesn't explain why, say, January 2020 is the lowest period of implied volatility on record in, uh, you know, in currencies. Um, I'll pass it on to Carmen and Ken to take up uh, some of the other points if they'd like. Um, I think I unmuted myself, but I can just yeah. answer that briefly. Good. Uh, first, thank you very much, Sylvia, for the excellent comments. Uh, we certainly wouldn't say central bank policy hasn't been doing a lot. We've been hearing that all day, but we draw a distinction between conventional monetary policy, interest rate policy, where I think of central banks as having independence and stuff which really it, they're operating as an agent of the treasury rather directly. We heard that this morning. Um, and so of course these policies you know, have, have, uh, have, have a big effect. And I just, just could emphasize one other point. I, th I think a big thing that's happened in COVID-19 is not just that central banks have hit the zero bound, but that markets basically view the neutral rate equilibrium policy rate to be kind of significantly negative right now. And they just don't think it's ever going to go to zero. So it's not the exchange rate theories, the, the old Dornbush ones don't just depend on today's interest rates for the whole future. And they just see it as gone. And we're emphasizing that point. Thank you. I, I, I would like to um, uh, connect something Sylvia put up in one of her slides and Alan's uh, question sort of working backwards on, on the conjecture part on what follows. Um, 
I, I was hoping Sylvia, you'd say a little more about the modern day Triffin dilemma and how what what it would look like. I, I'll I'll just make a comment on that. But Alan, I think the answer to to your the honest answer to your question, I have no clue uh, why the dollars depreciated uh, over the period. You know, I mean, you know, currency cycles being uh, you know difficult to predict. But on the bigger question, which is is the era of dollar dominance, if you will, uh, going to be uh, changed by COVID, um, which I think connects to your your, your question. Um, let me let me just quickly work backwards. One is uh, at the moment uh, major alternatives to the dollar. Uh, are difficult to contemplate. Uh, there may be scope for the euro regaining ground if if there's a unified uh, debt market that that grows, uh, you know, organically over time. Or um, there is the issue of lack of renminbi uh, convertibility. We have seen more of a flight into gold, but the, the main issue remains that it's it's difficult at the moment to uh, consider what that alternative may be. Although I, I, this goes back to the Triffin dilemma, you know, we pointed out in our 2019 paper uh, that, uh, you know, in the modern context, uh, the uh, outstanding debt in the US relative to the US share, share of global GDP, the global share of GDP has been declining uh, for the US, not as rapidly as for Europe, but it's been declining and particularly declining when you consider the increasing share of, of, of China. So there's the issue of, of, of uh, whether the, 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 what could under, undermine uh, the, the, the Bretton Woods II system is, it's uh, you know, related to the modern version of the Triffin Dilemma. Going back to one of the re one of the reasons we uh, also uh, highlight that the decline is a secular one. Um, you know, in the past twelve years, uh, I don't want to talk about central bank policy coordination. I, I there we really can't talk about coordination, but it so happens that I think oh, first in the two thousand eight two thousand nine crisis. And certainly during the COVID crisis, I think the synchronicity of policy changes in the major economies also have uh, played an important role uh, in, in the reduction, in the observed uh, reduction, both secular and more pronounced over the near term period uh, of, of uh, the major currency uh, exchange rate volatility. Let me stop there. I think we have a minute to uh, take a, another question from the audience. Um, Shabnam Kalimli Oskan had a question earlier. Can I go ahead? Uh, yes. So uh, Ken and Sylvia partly uh, touch upon this, but this is a beautiful paper and very insight insightful discussion. I would like to ask authors' conjecture in terms of the emerging markets. So. Uh, not to the extent of high income countries, of course, but emerging markets interest rate differentials were also going down and their inflation volatility were going down some time. So should we conjecture from this that, you know, their exchange volatility might go down? We didn't see this yet because I think it goes back to this intersection between financial risk and monetary policy. The difference between the emerging markets and high income countries, emerging markets monetary policy, of course, responds to exchange volatility where high income countries don't do that. So maybe it is the essence of that monetary policy credibility and the confidence Sylvia is talking about when, when you use it as, as a tool to respond to exchange volatility. So I would like to get your thoughts on that. Who wants to um, take that? Uh, Shabnam, I, I think, you know, the, we are in, in new territory on EM monetary policy. I mean, this is, this is really the first time that we have seen counter cyclical uh, monetary policy in the EMs pretty much across the board. Actually, you know, what you typically see during bad times and during a crisis is uh, a, a rise in the rates to, uh, uh, 
to uh, defend the currency. I, I think I'm very leery, uh, Shebnam also, this, but this also goes to Sylvia's point uh, regarding what to expect on the inflation front. Uh, I'm very leery. Uh, I understand that over the very, you know, uh, you know, the, the more the near future, uh, the collapse in aggregate demand swamps everything. Uh, but I, I, I think that, uh, you know, the, the, there are unknown supply shocks or lasting effects of supply shocks. We still uh, do not know. And I think Shevnem, um, you know, whether it's, whether that comes out more imminently uh, in emerging markets, that would be uh, my expectation. So if, if, if you're going to see a turning point uh, on the inflation side, I think you'd see it there first. Um, but let me stop. Great. Um, so thanks to the authors for a really interesting paper and to Sylvia for a good discussion, uh, and as well as the follow-up with the, the group Q&A. Um, we'll take a break now for five minutes. We'll be back at 3.30 Eastern for the last session. Thanks a lot. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.